this is the how you cannot love Italian food. Everyone gets in touch with the Italian culture. It's falls in love. Pasta. When you get a great artisanal pasta, cooks al dente is the best. What are the most popular food in America? Definitely are pizza and pasta. People love pizza so much because the flavor of the sauce with the oregano and the basil and garlic. It's this orchestra of natural elements that work in concert. Burrata, the creaminess and the richness and the stracciatelle inside, the best. Italian sausage, it's just one of the best sausages out there. On bread with some peppers, on pizza and pastas. You go to a football game, they're all cooking Italian sausage. It's a party food. The culture of wine to the Italian cuisine is just part of what we do. It has a reason why you share a glass of wine with food and friends. A day without wine is like a day without sunshine. Gelato is not just a dessert. It's rich, it's smooth, it's in our blood as Italians. It's not just about the way Italians cook, it's the way that they view food. They cook in the moment. We want it to stay very traditional, feel like they are at our house, eat our mom's dishes. We are explorers. I've always been a trendsetter and not a trend follower. Rigatoni Carbonara loves the ravioli and to die for it. With each restaurant we try to create a piece of Italy with our own eyes. Trust me, you're gonna like it. first known Italian to settle in Los Angeles was a man by the name of Giovanni Liandri, who we believe was from Genoa. He began ranching and farming immediately. He also began growing wine grapes. By the 1850s, a number of other Italians are also raising grapes for wine production. One of those is Antonio Pelanconi, who establishes a winery on Alvera Street. His former winery is today the oldest brick building in Los Angeles, the Pelanconi House. Long before Napa, Los Angeles was the center of wine production for the state of California, producing 50,000 gallons of wine by 1860, in and around what is now Alvera Street, which was then known as Wine Street. The majority of Italian immigrants, upwards of 75%, hailed from Italy's south. Regions such as Calabria, Sicilia, Puglia, most came to the United States for economic reasons. They encountered a climate that was similar to that of Italy. They were able to carry on with much of the lifestyle that they had. The style of cuisine that they introduce is often referred to as cucina povera, or the poor cuisine, the, the humble cuisine. Foods that featured inexpensive ingredients that were readily available. One of the first Italian restaurants that we know of, it was a boarding house called Hotel Italia Unita. It was operated by the Amillo family in the early 1880s on Alvera Street. These were the regional dishes of northern Italy where this family came from. At the time, Italian food was considered exotic. Many people were not familiar with what Italian food was. In order to attract the broadest customer base, these early Italian restaurants referred to themselves as Italo-French. They served dishes that were both Italian and French. By 1900, upwards of 60% of Italian Californians were engaged somehow in food production. My name is Santo Riboli and Cognome Riboli. Our family arrived in 1912. The first for generation was my uncle Santo. Their first job was to work for the railroad. In 1917, it was his idea to start the winery while he was still working for the railroad, and the winery was named after San Antonio de Padua, the winery of St. Anthony. 
The winery officially opened in 1917. It was really a, a very small little facility, but it catered to the community. And in those days, there were thousands of homes around us. So we had customers that really liked purchasing wine from our little Italian-owned winery. You have to admit, a lot of these early immigrants were pretty gutsy. Just in their mind, to better themselves and a challenge in the new world. The main job for the Italians here were railroads, restaurants, green grocers, things like that. But in the wine business, it was a very important occupation for the Italians. After World War I, my nono made three trips to America to work for Secondo Guasti. By the 1880s, there's another gentleman who arrives with a dollar in his pocket, and his name is Secondo Guasti. Uh, he comes to Los Angeles, establishes a winery. He forms a group of investors, also Italian immigrants, and they purchase land um, about 60 miles east of Los Angeles in a place called Cucamonga. And it's there that um, Secondo Guasti establishes what becomes the world's largest vineyard at the time. 5,000 contiguous acres. The village was called Guasti, but the winery was called the Italian Vineyard Company. Secondo Guasti gave Nono and people like him from the villages work and acclimate them to the American society. Guasti becomes a, a benefactor of the Italian community, but really a pioneer in Southern California's wine industry. That was really the beginning of our family in Southern California. Los Angeles's legacy as a wine producing center would have continued if it hadn't been for an unfortunate law by the name of Prohibition, which ended up destroying the local wine industry. How did San Antonio Winery survive Prohibition? Uncle Santo was a very, a very devout Catholic. In the community of Catholics in this part of Los Angeles, he was pretty well known. So we were given the right by the archdiocese to produce altar wines. We also sold juice to families. And the other thing we did, which was really interesting, selling tonic wine to drugstores. Vermouth with herbs. You would add things like iron and different vitamins. So that was three ways we survived prohibition. So you saw Italian immigrants not only farming and ranching, but also helping develop the food processing industry. Maestro Sausage, which is the oldest family-owned sausage manufacturer in Los Angeles. In the early 1920s, Puglia was not a very good place to live. So, you know, a lot of the immigrants from my town just got on a boat and came to the United States. My grandfather, who was also Domenico Pontrelli, he had no skills really. So what he did was he helped the railroad. And in the summertime, he would ice the produce. During the winter times, he would light the fires to keep the produce from freezing. He saved enough money. He wanted to work as a farmer. He would go from like New York to Wenatchee, Washington. The weather was horrible. It was raining every day. He said, forget this. I got to get out of here. They had a cousin down in the Los Angeles area. So he got on a train and came down to Los Angeles did everything from, he was a fight promoter, he worked as a butcher, until he saved up enough money and he had a cousin who had a grocery store on Main Street and he uh, started up his little butcher shop. He was very industrious, couldn't read, he couldn't write, but he was a hard worker and that's how he ended up starting the business. We originally were Eastside Market, we were an Italian deli. During the Great Depression it was one of the only places that served meat to the surrounding Italian community. When the Depression came, well, he had connections with all the different packing houses, so he could actually go and get meat, and then that's how his business really flourished. When you couldn't get anything because there were shortages, well, he always had it. He was a comedian. He was just a funny guy. He started a kazoo band. Couldn't play an instrument. He couldn't even read music. He got all his friends that played the kazoos, and who was he? He was the maestro. He'd always dress up in his tuxedo with a cigar, and he would get up and he would lead everybody. That's where the maestro came from. The important part about a traditional Italian recipe, it's a well-balanced sausage. It's perfect on its own, but when you put it into a dish, a pasta or a pizza, it gives life to that product without overpowering it. That's something we've tried to do throughout the ages. When you go from generation to generation, every generation adds something to the business. So my grandfather, he learned meats. 
When my uncle and my dad came, they learned how to expand. When my brother and I came is when we got our, you know, our 20,000 square foot facility. But that was only because I was able to go to school and I got an ed education in accounting and you know, how to run a business. So that's how we just kind of built and the company grew, you know, as we, as a family grew. I'm the fourth generation. This was my first desk right here. The, the, first, the first job anybody does here is, is you stand at this table and you assemble the sausage boxes. These boxes haven't changed since before I was born. Six, seven, eight years old, I'd spend my summers here making boxes and they used to pay me $5 a day. I knew that I wanted to be a part of the business. When you think about a lot of these immigrants that were coming here, they were kind of on their own. A lot of them, some were with families, but some were not. The Catholic faith here and the churches within the community, they really did give a lot of support. My dad, when he first came from Italy, the very first place, my uncle, Santo, brought my dad, Stefano, was to St. Peter's Church. To him, that was the most important thing. This is you in America, and this is your church now, and they're gonna help you, and you're gonna help them. These people were probably struggling in so many ways, financially, health-wise, whatever. You can go there, and they would help you. Gave them strength, support, morally, and really did help guide them on in America. So they were very, very important. Most Italian immigrants came to the United States for economic reasons. They came from this worldview of la miseria, this grinding poverty. And in the United States, their economic condition improved. They were suddenly able to purchase foods that had been luxuries, more meat, cheese, pasta, not only larger portions, but this kind of affirmation of the exorcism of hunger. Large platters of pasta, fist-sized meatballs, huge amounts of cheese. And so Italian-American cuisine is born. One of the earliest Italian restaurants in Los Angeles was known as Campi's. It advertised itself as the only first-class Italian restaurant in the city. There were a number of other restaurants that sprang up, Stella d'Italia, Antonioni, which were all located in Los Angeles' Little Italy. Some of these restaurants still advertise themselves as Italian French. Places like the Paris Inn, Clara Beau and Charlie Chaplin were known to dine there. The restaurant was also notoriously wet during Prohibition. You could go and enjoy an adult beverage without having to worry. This is when we see this evolution more of the red and white checker tablecloths, meatballs, spaghetti, lots of red sauce. They advertised that they served continental cuisine, and the continental cuisine label would supplant or replace the Italo-French. One of the most famous restaurants of that era that remains today is, of course, Hollywood's iconic Musso and Frank's, which opened in 1919. It's at Musso and Frank's that one of the most famous dishes associated with Italian-American cuisine is said to have been introduced. Douglas Fairbanks and Mary Pickford were honeymooning in Rome and they ate at a restaurant owned by a gentleman by the name of Alfredo Di Lelio, who produced a very simple fettuccine al burro, fettuccine with butter and parmigiano cheese. They begged Mr. Di Lelio for the recipe, brought it back to Musso and Frank's, and of course we're talking about fettuccine Alfredo. From that point forward, it became a dish synonymous with celebrities. Today we find highly derivative versions of the dish, and it worked its way across the United States. Nineteen forty one, a date which will live in infamy. In the early days of World War II, Italians were the enemy. You saw even many Italian restaurants in the United States and especially in Los Angeles make themselves less Italian. They changed their names 
the Italian-American grocery company during World War II became Little Joe's. Many of them would post signs at the entry, you know, American-owned, we have you know, boys serving abroad. Italian-Americans were the largest group serving in the United States military at the time. As we move out of the World War II era, there's much more acceptance when it comes to Italian-Americans, but also Italian cuisine. American GIs are returning from World War II with this newfound taste and, and love for Italian cuisine. They're returning to their towns looking for these flavors. At the same time, you see Italian Americans leaving many of their little Italys. So they're really helping Italian food spread. During this era, there's two brothers that come to Los Angeles from New York, and they're credited with introducing pizza to Los Angeles. I'm Philomena Diamore, and my father is Pasquale Diamore. My father came over from Italy with hardly any education, with a dime in his pocket, but he had this great personality, and he was a fabulous cook. His brother sent for him, and he met Franklin in New York in 1923. Franklin was in vaudeville, where he performed all over the world. He worked in the bakery, and from there, he opened up pizzerias, starting in White Plains, New York, and then onto the north end of Boston. My father was a young guy, and there were a lot of hoodlums running around then, and Franklin was very concerned that Patsy was maybe going to get involved. So Franklin told Patsy he would be performing in San Francisco. He told Patsy, well, I'm going to have, be working with a lot of beautiful women. And so anyway, that worked. <laughs> and he left New York. He realized in 1939, people in Hollywood, they had no idea what pizza was. So they decided to open up first pizzeria in Hollywood. And it was called the Casa de Amor. He needed a sit-down restaurant where his personality could bubble. In the next year, he opened the Villa Capri. The customer would come in and he'd go, welcome to America. <laughs> they just loved him. So he knew how to treat the customers. Eventually all the stars in Hollywood were there. James Dean had his own table in the kitchen. Joe DiMaggio courted Marilyn Monroe there. The main person, of course, was Frank Sinatra. And he just loved the food and he loved Patsy. By 1957, Frank decided to be partners with my dad and open up a big Villa Capri that was just down the street. The big Villa Capri opened and it aired on The Tonight Show in 1957. It had veal scallopini, veal franchise. And they used to make their own stock and throw the eggshells in there, all the little bits of this or that. They put a scoop in with the different dishes. My God, the food was so flavorful. What he accomplished, all the people that he palled around with, I mean, it was just amazing. The majority of Italian immigrants didn't necessarily achieve huge economic success in that first generation, but they were able to sit down at the dinner table with pride. After World War II, you see the expansion of the Italian-American food industry. Because of American protectionism, products from Italy cannot be imported. So Italian-American companies start producing many of these products domestically. Americans are looking to prepare a simple Italian dish in their home. You see things like Chef Boyardee. Uh, who's, you know, marketing canned ravioli. You also see the names of Italian foods such as lasagna and antipasto enter the American vernacular. We also see these very derivative versions of Italian cuisine, things like fried mozzarella sticks, canned spaghetti, these convenience foods that have definitely strayed quite a bit from their original Italian versions. When we started, Italian cuisine wasn't respected. The mozzarella that we used at that time was a piece of rubber cheese that was breaded, fried, tomato on top, and it was pretty awful. The more I went to Italy, the more I discovered ingredients. And I say, I gotta have it.
I was a typical little emigrant that landed in Brooklyn. I knew that there was more to America. With the support of some people that I will never forget, they told me, go to California. I had an uncle. He was the manager of a restaurant called Chesons, famous here in Los Angeles. And he was my first inspiration to something that I'll call hospitality. I couldn't speak English and my job at that time was to pick up the dirty dishes. That's something that I can grow from and make money. With a friend, we start talking about someday we would like to have a restaurant. Now, I did find a little place. He was horrible to say the least as a little beer bar in the middle of nowhere. When he kind of says, I will pursue it with you or without you, I say, hey, this is the chance for an adventure. We both put $5,000 each, and Valentino was born. What we were serving was Italian-American food of those days. The heavy sauces, the checker tablecloths, the Chianti bottles with the flask around. We didn't have more than a week to survive. The miracle happened that week. The Los Angeles Times had a major food writer, and she was very influential. She wrote very, very nice things about us. She starts the article by saying, I have a little gift for Christmas to my readers. It's Valentino that looks like a bride full of joy. The LA Times probably at that time was read by four million people. When the article came on Christmas Day of 1972, the phone started ringing and it never stopped. That was the beginning. We didn't know how to be prepared to the real pressure of expectation. I always remember the people that were instrumental in my life. And a guy came to my rescue in the most unusual way by telling me how horrible my food was. His name was Sid Greenberg. He was the CEO of Standard Brand. I was the best running guy that he has ever seen, the biggest smile he has ever seen, how wonderful it is. But the bottom line is the food is terrible. And suddenly those tables will be empty. Suddenly you scratch your head and you say, what am I going to do? It changed my life by giving me this crisis. I am a little Sicilian boy that never went to culinary school. I have to learn fast, otherwise this little jewel called Valentino will disappear. I had met a journalist that came to do a dossier about Italian wine in America. His name was Pino Kyle, and he says, if you ever come to Milan, please look me up. I call him up and I say, I'm willing to come to Milan, please teach me. I did go to Milano. I went to this restaurant that was called Giannino, and it was a revelation. Great smells, great expression of what the kitchen can do. The director of the restaurant tell Mr. Kyle, we have great truffles, great porcini, we're going to do something. I didn't understand what the word tartuffi was. When they present me with a beautiful dish of silky raw meat, and then they brought this thing that looked like a potato and they start grating, Needless to say, that became my baptism to great Italian food. It's a funny little story. I went with my best friend to dinner at his first restaurant, which was Mauro's. We got in the last reservation, then at one point, Mauro, who I come to find out later was Mauro, he took our hand and he kissed them and brought us to the table. After we sat at the bar for about a half an hour, he said, let's go somewhere to have cocktails. Now it's about 1.30 in the morning. And there's one place open called Sarno's, and they sang opera. Every Friday night, he would take his staff and, and they would have a late dinner and they would, you know, drink. He made me sit next to him, which I thought was very odd because my, my best friend was beautiful and she was always the one who got the boys. And so I thought, oh, that is odd. The next thing I know, he's got his hand on my knee. What are you doing? I said. And he says, I just want to kiss. And I said, what are you, out of your mind? <laughs> From that point forward, we were together. He was a cinematographer in Italy. He had come several times to Los Angeles to do filming and he had never found an Italian restaurant that was, in his words, Italian. 
was married to an American woman and they decided to move to Los Angeles, 1975-ish. I'm gonna open a restaurant because there's no food I can eat in Los Angeles. One of his customers is a developer. He got a lot of these old Art Deco buildings that were built in the 20s, and one of the buildings was the Oviat building downtown. They unlocked the doors and walked into this open space, and he goes, oh my God, this looks like the dining room of an old Italian ocean liner called Rex, hence the name Rex Il Ristorante. At the price I'm paying for this stock, Mr. Morse, you are going to be a very rich man. I'm rich enough. I just want to head my shipyard. Slippery little suckers. He decided it's going to be all Italians in the restaurant. The chef, the servers, everything came from Italy. At one point, there were approximately 20 people living with us. A new chef coming over, the people that made coffee the way he liked it. He brought over bartenders the way he liked to see the Italian cocktail. There were even births in our house. I would just come home at night and Mauro would be holding court. There was always someone around. Initially, it was not well received. In Italy, there were a couple of restaurateurs who were doing La Nuova Cucina, new cuisine. Basically, what it was was a six, seven, eight course dinner, but very small portions so that you'd get a taste of this, taste of that. People didn't quite understand that. You'd read comments, well, we had to go out and have a hamburger after we ate it, Rex. It wasn't filling it up. But he kept on going. What I'm doing is right, and I'm not going to change this review came out and people, they literally drove miles just to go to eat because they wanted an authentic Italian meal. Piero, when they met, they found this bond. They would get groups of people, restaurant critics, writers, and they would take them to Italy, maybe four times a year. And they would say, this is what real Italian food is. This is why this cheese is better than that cheese, why this tomato is different than that tomato. He brought over a man who made coffee from this little coffee place in Milano because he said it was the, the perfect espresso. And so the kid came over. He lived with us for a little while, of course. Everything at the Rex made it feel very special. Mauro was at the helm. He made sure that everybody was treated like they'd never been treated before. When Mauro was sick, and he was unfortunately not well for the last four months of his life, I didn't know this until after he passed. He had called Gino Angelini, one of the finest chefs around, and Mauro said, Gino, I'm not long for this world. I need you to do me a favor, and I need you to take care of Maureen for, for a couple of years. Get her started, do something so that she's okay. <sighs> and so, um, and hence was born Vincenti Ristorante. He got this restaurant started. I love America, no? it's the dream. Mauro, one day they arrived in Italy, we become in honeymoon with Maureen. You come in LA with me. I said, Mauro, I need to talk with my children. I go for three months in Los Angeles. I say, okay, father, you go for three months. Now it's 25 years. I was 42. I grew up in the countryside of Rimini. They want to become a pilot. No, 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 no. I won't, I won't go to the cooking school. The first day I arrived in the cooking school, I need to wash all the pots and pans. Real restaurant, real hotel. And one week we work, and one week we study. When I arrive here, Mauro tell me, never compromise, do it what you believe. We open after 9-11, unfortunately. I was very scared. At this point, we need to open. The Osteria start, we, we, we simply more and more, at least after 20 years, the business, it ties the wood. <laughs> good food at the good price and the good quality. Listen, I have many customers, they meet here, they marry, now they have the children, they have 13, 14, and they come in because I remember this is my daughter. Oh my God, she's 20 years old. I'm American Italian now, but my mentality is Italian. When we started, we had one page wine list that was absolutely dreadful. A company comes, they make 
at least with the wines that they want to sell, and that's the end of it. At that time, there were incredibly strange wine, like Lancers that was in a clay bottle, Matus that was in half moon bottles. Italian wines were really pitiful. They didn't have much market in America. Pinot Kyle had the smarts. California was improving his technology after he was my guide, you know, in the trip to Italy. He wanted to invite them to come to California, to the winemaker. So one day, around 1979, a big bus stopped in front of Valentino and 45 people came out of the bus. And I'm shaking hands with this gentleman named Pier Antinori, this gentleman named Antonio Mastro Berardino, this gentleman named Franco Biondisanti, this gentleman named Pio Boffa, Pio Cesare, and on and on. Half of them, I didn't know who they were. Some of them I had read about. It became a point to have them in my wine list. People say, what are your favorite wines? And my answer was, they are the wines of my friends. But when you start having thousands of friends, it becomes difficult. After the Wine Spectator came to visit me in 1980 and he says, you have a good wine list, we want to reward you. I got into this fever, I got to have anything. It becomes a sense of pride. I couldn't do without a great wine list because I know so much about wine that I got to continue following the world of wine, which is a world that never ends. So here is Fra Franco Biondi Sandy giving me one of five existing bottles of 1891 Brunello di Montalcino, one of the very first that the family produced. A friend of mine in the Napa Valley had given me a beautiful magnum with my face etched in the bottle, and after that bottle broke, he sent me the same bottle, but with the little sign that says, Herquake Edition. It was a payback of believing. Valentino, grew from the little simple trattoria to a finer restaurant with an incredible wine list. I want to introduce you to what I just discovered in my last trip to Italy. I want to introduce you to something that I went personally and got. At the beginning, when I started bringing the truffles, it was frustrating to have people that say, no, I don't want to fish today, no, without understanding what truffles was. Truffles were brought in by Piero and Mauro. They were probably the first Italian restaurateurs to bring in anything like that. We start taking the word for better restaurant, continental cuisine into Italian cuisine. One of those great changes that I'm very proud of. So in the 1980s, you see Italian food evolving once more. The tastes of American consumers are maturing. Americans are traveling to Italy more. So we see more authentic Italian products entering the United States and American consumers are a little bit more affluent. They're willing to spend more. So in 1986, I came up with this idea. Let's have a restaurant which will be called Primi. A lot of things on the table, family style and small portions. Introduce American to my favorite peas. Porcini, prosciutto, pizza, and all of the things that are big words of the Italian glossary. Primi became immediately an international success. The chef that probably was the most historical, Angela Uriana. My mission was to stay true to who I was and what I believe in. I learned to cook in my hometown, which is Bergamo. About 23 years old, I've been approached by a friend saying, guess what, there is a gentleman that is looking for a chef to go in the United States. There is a ticket and you can leave like immediately. And I said, sure. Frankfurt to New York, New York to Miami. We carry a box for one person that was in Miami, and so we don't even know what's in there. We were alternating, so sometimes I carry it, sometimes the medical carries it. No knowledge of English. We are on the flight from New York to Miami, and I look at Mimo and I go, do you have the package? And he looks at me, I thought you had it. So basically we realized that we left in New York.
the excitement of getting there, all of a sudden had this nightmare. They said, what are we going to say to this person? We were able to call the airport in New York and the next day the package arrived. Because it was such a, a responsibility and there was this you know, trauma, I said to Andrea, listen, you don't have to tell me, but at least can I please understand what did I carry or what I would have lost for the rest of your life? And he goes, oh, it's my first book or recipe of my school. And then there was a pair of yellow espadrillas, you know, the <laughs> I couldn't put it in my pocket. You know, we were carrying this like a bomb. Moral of the story is you have to have faith. This restaurant was dinner only, and then at midnight it will become a disco. An Italian asked me the first question. What do you think about uh, America now that you're here? I said, I see a lot of drunk people all together. The menu will be items such as spaghetti with tomato. The second item would have been spaghetti with tomato and basil. The third item would have been spaghetti, tomato, and mushroom. <laughs> so there were 12 types of spaghetti. I thought I was from the moon. How can you have this minimalistic change and call it a dish that is completely different? I'm looking at the dessert menu and say, you guys don't make tiramisu? I say, what? What's tiramisu? Okay, so from tomorrow we change the menu. We said, say, wait, wait, not so far. Why don't you guys start working with this menu and little by little you can change. We were able to change the menu and we were very innovative. August came, it was so hot. I said, what would be another place that I could visit that is a beautiful summer but not so humid? The answer was easy, California. <laughs> Family friend are in Los Angeles working for Piero Selvaggio. Piero Selvaggio was open in a second location called it Premium Restaurant. Piero's dream was to have an old Italian young fellow in the kitchen and so I was ambushed. The next day, I was interviewed by Piero Selvaggio. I made a risotto, because the question was, can you make a risotto? I said, yes. <laughs> the first two ingredients that I find, peppers and oysters. I made the risotto for us, and you say, okay, when do you start? I was getting $100 less a week <laughs> pay, but it was the best move. Staring at the wine cellar of Valentino, it was always uh, something that gives you chills. It's like a museum. After about a year, the chef of Valentino was leaving to open his own restaurant. We've been told tonight, Piero Selvaggio will come to the restaurant, will sit down on a round table, will have a meal, and he will announce his choice of the next chef for Valentino. It could be you, it could be me, we'll see. Long story short, we have the meal, and then, you know, he says, Angelo. And I go, yes. No, he says, I chose Angelo. <laughs> I, and I go, oh, I didn't pay attention then. <laughs> A little scared, but uh, <laughs> I started, and he lasted for 18 years, until 2003, when I left to open my own restaurant. Nouveau Cuisine starts in the 80s. I consider myself a son of the Nouvelle Cuisine, transformed into what is fresher and where there are less steps and where the ingredient speaks for himself, closer to, say, Japanese style. We wanted to speak purity. Piero Selvaggio Primi was all about little bites. I remember this daisy pasta filled with two types of cheese, dolce latte, gorgonzola, and mascarpone with the poppy seed saffron sauce. There was an oxtail sugo with the funduta that will support the flavor, texture, and ingredients were innovative for the time, which is called the Nouvelle Cuisine. It's timeless, and that's the beauty of it, and that's also telling the story of our culture. Mauro Vincenti used to call me professor. <laughs> a professor. I am proud to be Italian because this is who I am and where I come from. I call myself a very late bloomer. My mother loved to cook, 
but I never cooked with her. I grew up in the 60s. TV dinners were just gaining popularity and I thought they were the greatest in college. There was this incredibly handsome guy and I found out he worked in the kitchen and I thought, well, I know how to get to him. I'm gonna work in the kitchen. I said I'd like to cook. I don't think I made anything before. And it was love. It wasn't the love of food, it was the love of a person. It's some sort of love that brings you into a kitchen. I loved the idea of bringing pleasure to people. When I would put out a dish and somebody would come back to me and say, that was so delicious. My first restaurant that I opened, Campanile, the building of the restaurant, had this big tower. Campanile means the bell tower. The Campanile was also the meeting place, which a restaurant is. Our menu was inspired by the time that I rented a house in Tuscany where I had the opportunity to buy fresh produce from the street markets and I got to cook in a way that I love to cook, which was simple, flavorful, seasonal food. I don't know if it was Jonathan Gold or if it was a restaurant reviewer that coined the phrase California Italian back when we opened Campanile back in 1989. California cuisine meant that there was a lot of vegetables on the menu, food tended to be lighter, and then we had some Italian products that reinstated how important it is to start with the best ingredients. And really, 80% of your work as a cook is done for you. You know, thank goodness for Mother Nature. How about Papa Pomodoro? A tomato bread soup, right? With seasonal tomatoes, and stale bread, olive oil, some great red wine, you've got yourself a hot meal. We didn't open up restaurants because we felt that they were trendy. We opened up restaurants so that we have an excuse to share our passion. One of my favorite practices in eating a good Italian meal is the ending, ripping off that hunk of bread and just cleaning the plate so it doesn't even need to be washed. Probably the most important piece of furniture in a home is the table. The amount of time that is spent at an Italian table is the secret, I think, to life. In the 1990s, we also see this phenomenon of non-Italian chefs celebrating Italian food, Italian ingredients. People like Wolfgang Puck, Nancy Silverton, Joachim Spichal. While some of their restaurants weren't solely Italian, they were presenting Italian dishes and Italian products. I'm from Los Angeles, six generations in California. I got my start in French cooking. I think what drove me to Italy was the history. I am just a small storyteller in thousands of years of tradition. Innovation is dangerous. Um, for me, my perspective only. I, I, think, I think that the most valuable ingredient and least utilized by young chefs is restraint. Restraint. Taking the ego and the personal inflection out of the dishes and allowing tradition to be your North Star. I call it the Coco Chanel effect. Coco Chanel would get fully dressed and before she left the house, take one thing off. Perfect, okay? That, for me, is Italian food. I moved to Bologna in 2007. There weren't a lot of chefs making pasta by hand. Pasta fatto a mano, il mattarello. There was nobody. 
I stumbled upon Paola Ferrara, who is a friend to this day. Uh, she had a web page, and I clicked on it. And I get chills thinking about that moment where I found my master. I said, I want to come and learn. She said, sure, it'll be a thousand euros. I'll see you when you get here. Okay, great. I stayed as long as they would keep me every single day, six days a week, sometimes up to 12 hours a day until they would say, just go home. Evan on it, go home. My pasta 12 years later is very much a confluence of this traditionally minded woman who gave me the heart and soul. That goes for every single of the 155 shapes that I know to this day by hand, no machines. Take for instance the tortellini. There's a medieval myth that goes like this. Venus and Zeus were in a great battle and they were all tuckered out. They find themselves an inn. So they go to the innkeeper and they have a, a great feast to celebrate and they decide to share a room. The innkeeper is so taken aback by the beauty of Venus that he finds himself at their door and he peeks through the keyhole and the vision of Venus's navel is the only thing that he can see and he's so inspired that he runs straight back to the kitchen and creates the tortellini. And if you turn the tortellini upside down, it actually looks like a navel. The stories are not mine. I am just a custodian of these histories and my only job is to tell these stories in the most authentic way possible. Sometimes a bowl of pasta is a bowl of pasta, but when the connection happens, it's for life. And if someone sits down at Felix and they have Tonarelli Cacio Pepe, and it brings them to a time that they were in Rome at Da Cesare or Da Enzo or whatever, and they say, you remember that time we were at Da Cesare? This was, that was way better. This is not even close. Or they say, this is not bad. If I can get this is not bad from an Italian, I win. It's, or it's not as bad as La Mamma, but you did okay, kid. That is the juice every single time. It's what we do on a daily basis that defines us. I was in the Air Force. I was at home watching TV on the sofa. There was an advertisement and say like, do you want to be the new master chef? And I said like, sure. And I decided uh, after master chef in Italy to really try to start from zero and reinvent my career. Six years ago, I applied here for the Beverly Hilton Hotel. I became the executive chef. From September to January, it's all about the Golden Globes. Overall, it's uh, like 11,845. Play that. For the day in the kitchen, you are looking about almost 1,000 people working. After the Golden Globes, you can do everything. There is no event that uh, can scare you. The first year in particular, we did a risotto. I reproposed something like it was very simple. When you say risotto ai funghi porcini with parmigiano reggiano, are really three ingredients, rice, mushrooms, and cheese. <laughs> then you try to chase a lot of things, and uh, you get lost. Simplicity is actually the real innovation. For us as Italian, the food must be good. The next step is the sharing. It's like to be with the people that you love. In Italy, you learn all the beauty, you build yourself. Here in America, you find a land of opportunity. If you really put your head in the right place, there is nothing can stop you. I grew up here in Los Angeles. I would spend almost all my summers in Bologna. And I always knew that I wanted to cook Italian food. I had actually moved to New York to study pre-med. That's when a friend basically took out a phone book and said, this is the cooking school. If you don't call them, I'm going to call Why? them for Why you. Because he knew that it was my passion. Piero uh, and my mom knew each other. So uh, I was able to contact Piero Salvaggio. And I remember I met with him. I was wearing a suit, trying to impress him. And first thing he said to me is he looked at me, he's like, why do you want to be a, a chef? <laughs> he saw me more as a front of the house guy. He sent me twice to go work in Italy. First was in Rome, but then I was able to spend the second time in Sicily. 
And I remember going to Modica to a restaurant, like they were poking their head out of the kitchen to look at me because I was one of Piero Salvaggio's guys. Like he's, he's so famous in that part of the world. I eventually helped open his restaurant Valentino in Las Vegas in 1998. It started to be easier to get real Italian food. One day when I was out walking and I was like, I want to cook the food I grew up eating. I want to cook the food my mom would feed me, my nonna. And that's how we decided to move forward with Rosso Blu. Rosso Blu was intended to tell a story of my life, a modern restaurant in Los Angeles the city I grew up in, and uh, also with the cooking from the other city that I grew up in that I love in Bologna. The, the restaurant business is about restoration. People sometimes come in here and they're broken. They need to be restored. And it's our job to provide that. Italian food, in my opinion, is based on simplicity. Being able to strip away a layer or two, like I always tell some of my younger cooks, I'm like, that could be a good dish, just take out three or four of those ingredients. <laughs> I never wanted to reinvent Italian cuisine. I wanted to uh, just cook really, really good, simple food with great ingredients that you know people love to eat. Well, as an Italian, I taught that everyone. We learned from the beginning with our mom. At 14 years old, my mom uh, had a bed and breakfast 10 miles from Verona. What do you do? You work with mom in the kitchen. I told his sister get married with an American GI. I asked my sister if I could be with her two, three, four months to try to learn English. I never left. I got hired in a French restaurant called La Vie en Rose. They hired me as the dishwasher. This restaurant was for sales. It was not on the ship that it is today. And with a handshake, I was able to buy this restaurant with a future deal. Here I am after 33 years. I had to change to Italian steakhouse. People call and say, hey, what kind of food you serve? Italian. Okay, thank you. Because some people think Italian only pasta and pizza. When I decide to say Italian steakhouse, people say, oh, what do you have on the menu? My mom was here in vacation from Verona, my home. After lunch in an espresso, I said, oh, let's go to Boys Girls Club. There's a lot of children there. My mom loves kids. We went there. I was a seven-year-old kid eating potato chips. And the director told me that was his dinner. And I asked him, why? He said, because most probably the kids live in a motel area. There's no kitchen. I translate in Italian to my mom. As an Italian mom, what does she say? Why don't you feed him pasta? That was the first one. Right now, we are at 5,000 passes every day. We are in over 100 locations. Very soon, we're going to celebrate the 7 million meals already served. I do believe that most every Italian chef restaurateur has donated to charity or to people in need. It. America is the land of opportunity. I believe as a dishwasher, after seven years on your own restaurant, I don't think it will have happened in Italy. When you go to an Italian restaurant, it's a movie. You're dressing up. Your girlfriend, your wife, your companion dressing up. From the moment you walk in, from the last part of the dessert, you have the good Italian wine. After you finish the tiramisu, you leave the restaurant, you bend to Italy. You know, we all know Barada is the newest member of the mozzarella family. 20 years ago, you wouldn't have known what I'm talking about. So I buy my Barada from Mimo Bruno. Well, I was born in Bari, Puglia, the famous Puglia, and came to America in 1987 with the goal to create this cheese factory. One morning, I saw this cheese plant across the street from my house. I walked in, I said, you guys need help? They said, yes. I started from 11 years old, cleaning vats, and then finally I put my hands inside the cheese, and then finally I was making batches of cheese. By the time I was 16 years old, I learned with the cheese masters. When I came to California, I had zero money. I got this cheese plant, which was shut down. The owner told me that he didn't want any money. Just pay the debts, I will give you the place, it's free. 
One day, I walked into the Rex, which was owned by Mauro Vincenti. He tried the product, he said, uh, congratulations, you have a really great product, but, he told me, do you know how to make burrata? How do you know burrata? Because back then, it was only new in Puglia region. And I was surprised for this guy from Rome, Mauro Vincenti, asking me burrata. So I went back to the plant, I made the burrata, went back to the restaurant, and he had back then a famous chef, Gino Angelini, and even Gino was not even interested in putting it on the menu because he didn't know what it was. We're not interested, we don't want it. I was kind of disappointed, and as I'm driving on La Brea, I see on my left side an Italian restaurant called the Campanile. I walked to the back door, I saw this beautiful lady, Nancy Silverton, and I introduced myself. I'd have a try the burrata. She tasted it, went crazy for it, added as a special that night, and the day after was all over Los Angeles time. I had phone calls from all the, the Italian chefs. So we had to have an American woman, not Italian, introducing an Italian product, which I, I grew up with. It started spreading. We would get calls from New York, Chicago, everybody asking for burrata. We are almost in all the states in America, plus we ship to uh, Mexico, Canada, Japan, uh, Singapore and Korea. I started with 500 gallons a week, and today we are 24,000 gallons a day. We are the largest manufacturer on the West Coast. I am a gelato addicted since I was a very, very young kid. Gelato Festival started in Florence 12 years ago. We made events all over the world to spread the culture of artisanal Italian gelato. Gelato chefs, they have to create a one-time flavor for the competition and they are judged by a jury of experts and by the popular jury. Here in Los Angeles, uh, we showcase some of the best flavors of the past 12 years. Dolce Vita from Florence, Fior di Latte chocolate hazelnut spread, blueberry basil from New Jersey is probably the most popular. Another flavor that is really popular, it's uh, from an Italian chef based in Arizona, Stupify, with uh, lotus biscuits, gingerbread, and a dairy base. Gelato, the product is under 10% of fat, always. Ice cream, average fat, 20%. Gelato, 8, 9, 10%. There are two different products. Today, Gelato Festival is well known in Los Angeles with two locations. Gelato is really penetrating the market. Americans, they love gelato. It's not just a dessert. There is a history behind. And this is our roots. Italy, I feel it's such a country and a culture of food. So it was easy for me to find my first job in a restaurant. And then I went to culinary school, La Scuola Alberghiera. And I love my job. It takes me to different places. I was a few months in Hawaii, and then I was in the Bahamas. I traveled to the East Coast a lot. We kind of came in the kitchen and see how I was doing stuff, and she was really interactive with me. Zoe is a great cook too. They learn the Italian culture. Enjoying the food, enjoying the convivialità. I love to show them how we do it. I've been in the United States for 20 years. I used to work in film. And about five years ago, I decided that it was time for me to either go back to Italy or stay here and do something that made me feel uh, more complete. I was like, you know, how about I do what I like? We found the location in 2018. I sold all I had. And I said, okay, let's do it. I was like, how do I get this uh, done? How is it gonna make people happy? I called a friend, said, oh, you should call this Italian guy, Miguel. I was like, no, that must be like, uh, you know, Argentinian, it must be Michele. No, no, Miguel. I went, okay, let me call Miguel. I said, do you want to come and see a place? How about tomorrow morning? I'm like, oh, wow, that's my boy. We ended up opening with a generator. We did not even have electricity. We laughed so much. He quit after two weeks. 
<laughs> he quit. He ran into the kitchen. He looked at me. I'm giving two weeks notice right now. I looked at him. I'm like, oh, God. He's familiar with the pizza, Michele. Being uh, a 16 inches, I get to the table and I see two pizzas. I look at them like, first time, right? <laughs> <laughs> when people say thank you, I respond you, thank you. You're bringing money, dude. What are you talking about? We exist because of you. Our pizza is pomodoro and mozzarella. The fact that our cuisine overall is very simple, that it tastes good. They want to have a nice experience. They want to have fun. They want to they wanna be proud of a date. They want to go home happy. We took a risk. We said, this is what we know how to do, and this is our offering. If I can achieve that every night is memorable, that every night is gorgeous, we win. I came in LA in 2008 uh, for adventure, and I had an open airplane ticket for six months, and I never went back. When my son was born, my mother joined me with Francesca. Georgia was finishing university in Italy, so she arrived just a little bit after. Mama started cooking in Los Angeles for the kids that she was taking care of. She was a nanny, she was making wonderful meals for these kids. At the end, the parents of the kids were eating too. They asked me, okay, the gnocchi are wonderful. Can you produce for us and tell us the price? I can make the quantity, but I don't know anything about prices. This guy that I was serving in a restaurant told me, you know, you should open your own place. And I said, actually, I am. I need to buy a pasta machine. It's $5,000. He took his checkbook out of his pocket and he wrote me a check. When you have it, give it back to me. No pressure. A couple of months later, we were open. I met him again and he told me, how's everything going? You know, the difficulties of the beginning. Do you need anything? I don't want to ask, but you know, $25,000 would really help. And he opened his checkbook again, and he wrote me a check. When you have it, give it back to me. When we opened the big restaurant, so I brought him in to show him. And he told me again, you need anything at all. So look, I'm a little short. I would need probably 175000 and he looked at me and he said, uh, unfortunately, I don't have my checkbook with me. <laughs> <laughs> Italian food can be very expensive. We wanted to give the opportunity to everybody to try good food. The first day that we opened, we were just us. The first customer that came in and asked for the panino prosciutto, she told me, how can I make it? And I said, just in the way that you make it for yourself. We wanted to stay very traditional. Our goal is to have them come here at the restaurant and feel like they are at our house. When we got the first order of pasta, my mom asked me, how do we want to serve it? Let's create an experience. Let's build this pasta in a little tower, in this white dish, beautiful there. When we opened the restaurant, we had $250 in the bank. If we don't have customer today, tomorrow we close. The American factor that really changed things for us was social media. One day, my mother answered the phone and someone on the other side told her that... Something that I didn't understand. <laughs> she didn't understand yeah. at all. She wrote uh, a name on a piece of paper. I look and I said, BuzzFeed. They wanted to make a clip and they want us to participate. And so we agreed. It was a competition between three restaurants with three price points that were making similar dishes. A friend of mine sent me a text saying, hey, congratulations for the video, it came out. There were already 3.5 million people that watched it. I watched it and we won this competition. The next day, we had 500 people outside the door, and everybody wanted to try our pasta. 
We opened at 11.30 in the morning. At two o'clock, everything in the kitchen was finished. For a year and a half, we still had 500 people outside the door every single morning. People really liked us because we're a family. Sometimes we were stopping by to eat. Sometimes we were just stopping by to talk. I have the book of my mom. There are recipes for uh, dishes and there is a recipe for life. From the simple things to more complicated, how to organize a wedding. It's a kind of story also of my family. My relation with Italy is uh, everything. It's my past, uh, it's what I'm doing now, and it's going to be my future. I was uh, uh, a cyclist. Uh, I had a small accident, like uh, it didn't allow me to go with the bicycle for a while. So I start to get closer to the kitchen. The Italian kitchen is one of the oldest in the world. What American and people in general love is like our way to be. Like, I feel that more that be like an innovator, uh, we are um, explorers. And what always Massimo say to us is to look at the past with a critic way and not in a nostalgic way. We put in the menu fettuccine alfredo, so it's something very traditional. We are thinking like to Italianize like in the best way, instead of like chicken, like we use the chicken skin to give some umami. We like make it uh, dry and then we, we are grating on top as the cheese. Then uh, instead to use like the cream, uh, we did a uh, uh, oyster emulsion. So there is like fish to mix these two things and find a way to uh, make it more Italianized. America, here is where the dreams can become true. The Golden Globe is such an experience. The first year in particular, we did a risotto. Jennifer Lawrence was on the red carpet. The ballroom was already cleaned up. We were in the kitchen with the other people eating the risotto. She came in the kitchen and she grabbed that one of the plate of the guys. She seated with us eating risotto. That was so funny. Uh, I met Aston Carter, Mila Kunis. I met Nicole Ricci, Adele. I go into the dining room and there is Elizabeth Taylor. They invited me to sit with them. I kind of brush your arm. And she says, no, no, you have to give me a kiss. <laughs> and uh, that, of course, is when people say, you know, did you wash your lips after that? <laughs> we had Gwyneth Paltrow, Cameron Diaz and Drew Barrymore having dinner together. And it was just like a normal night out for them. And we went and said hi and they were very sweet. Owen Wilson, he gets his arrabbiata sauce and he eats by himself. Many people don't recognize him, but uh, our cashier do. We did a private dinner, RBK Tell, Joe Pesci, Leonardo DiCaprio, Al Pacino and Robert De Niro. When I saw De Niro and Pacino sitting together, you have to be kidding me. I had to evacuate a major party one time because the King of Spain had to come, so he had priority. And we talk about wines and we talk about soccer. In that moment, and only in that moment, you just say, well, but it's just a nice person. California was often described as our Italy, the Italy of the United States. Oscar Wilde said, Southern California is Italy without the art. All the agricultural products that are produced here. California has the largest pistachio crop outside of the Middle East, artichokes, which is a crop that Italian immigrants introduced to the state. One of the most famous dishes to come out of Southern California is the Caesar salad, invented by a gentleman by the name of Cesare Cardini. When prohibition was enacted, many Southern Californians would flock to Mexico. Cesare Cardini establishes a restaurant in Tijuana, and he pioneers this table-side preparation of a salad with um, really whatever ingredients he could source, anchovies, egg, olive oil, romaine lettuce, and it becomes the Caesar salad. It was here in this land of abundance that there was a synergy between Italian immigrants, the possibilities that the land engendered, 
and the people who wanted to kind of carry on that Italian way of life. It's not just about the way Italians cook. They have this reverence for, for the food that they grow, the food that they eat, the processes, the history. With each restaurant, we create a piece of Italy with our own eyes. One of the first immigrants came from Italy with the boat. Look at the Statue of Liberty. There was no food for them, and they finally start to open the little Italian restaurant. That's when I was born. The word serving, which is still what I do after 50 years, is something that I like to take it off my vocabulary, and yet is my reason that I am a server. Maybe the story has not been told thoroughly enough. We have to tell stories. This is how it's been passed on. It makes you feel good inside, but there is also a saying that everything that is great has to finish at one point to realize how good it was. The more we tell these stories, the, the longer the stories will, will live. More than ever, Americans are adopting it as their own. Happy World Week of Italian Cuisine to everyone. So happy World Week, World Week of World Italian Week. Cuisine to everybody. Everyone. everyone. Okay. And I want to wish uh, a happy Italian. <laughs> and I want to wish a happy World Italian Cuisine to everyone. No. World. Happy World Week of Italian Cuisine to everyone. <laughs> happy World Week of Italian Cuisine, everybody. Grazie, ciao. Happy World Week of Italian, Italian cuisine, cuisine, cuisine to everyone. <laughs> Happy World Week. No, I forgot. <laughs> so say it again. Happy World Week of Italian cuisine to everyone. Okay. <laughs> Happy World Week. Aspetta. Happy World Week of Italian, of Italian cuisine to everyone. Okay. okay. I think I can do it. So, uh, Happy World Week of Italian cuisine to everyone. Happy World Week to Italian cuisine for everyone. Happy World Week of Italian cuisine a tutti to everyone. <laughs> happy, happy World Week of Italian cuisine to everyone. And you, you to everyone. And you, we're gonna be there the whole week. Happy World Week of Italian cuisine. And may it last forever because it's such a joy that we get from this. Our food, our wine, our people, we should never forget our history and our culture. It doesn't matter where we are in the world, these are things we should not forget. But it's up to us to teach our children and our children to teach theirs. Happy World Week of Italian Cuisine to everyone. Happy World Week of Italian Cuisine to everyone. Happy World Week of Italian Cuisine to everyone. Happy World Week of the Italian Cuisine to everyone. <laughs> Italian. Happy World Week of Italian Cuisine. Happy World Week of Italian Cuisine to everyone. Okay, so say it again. Happy World Week to it of Italian Cuisine. Happy World Week of Italian Cuisine to everyone. Happy whole week. <laughs> Wait, write it down for me. <laughs> Happy World Week. Hold on, wait, let me do it again. <laughs> Happy World Week of Italian Cuisine to everyone. Happy World Week of Italian Cuisine to everyone. Happy World Week of Italian Cuisine. Happy World Week of Italian Cuisine to everyone. A happy Italian World Week. Eat well, 
Think Italian. I wish to everyone happy World Week of Italian cuisine. <laughs> <laughs>